Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Joanne Lamont. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the situation at Glasgow School of Art. Minister Ben McPherson. Following the tragic fire in June, the Macintosh building has been stabilised and residents displaced by the fire have been able to return home. Both the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council have provided funding to local residents and businesses in recognition of the significant impact the fire has had on them. I understand that some local street closures remain in place while further work is completed. Investigations into the cause of the fire are ongoing, will be thorough and comprehensive, and it will take time to complete this complex task. Joanne Lamond. Thank you. It is evident that the Glasgow School of Art has cultural, social and economic significance far beyond Glasgow itself. It's also evident that the impact of the fire at the Glasgow School of Art has had a very direct and very serious impact on the local community and local businesses, with significant implications, I believe, for the Glasgow and West of Scotland economy. I believe it's a challenge which goes beyond that of the city itself. Can I ask if the Minister is aware whether the Cabinet Secretary, who indicated that she did wish to hear directly from businesses their concerns, whether she has met with them and what the outcomes of those discussions were, and if she has not met with the businesses and local residents, does he believe that she will commit to do that to ensure that the response by the Scottish Government financially is commensurate with the scale of the challenge the local community and local businesses now face as a consequence of that very serious fire? Minister. Thank Joanne Lamont for that question uh, and would agree with her comments about the significance of, of the building as an institution and its wider impact. Uh, the member will be aware that in July the Scottish Government announced that it would establish a recovery fund of up to £5 million to assist businesses impacted by the Glasgow fires and to date Glasgow City Council has paid out over £2.9 million from this fund to 195 businesses. With regard to her request for a meeting, I would uh, request that the member writes to myself and the Cabinet Secretary with details of the businesses that she is in correspondence with and we can consider that proposal. Thank you. I've got three supplementaries. The first from Sandra Hoyt to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Sandra Hoyt. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, Minister, at the November meeting of Blythewood and Broomer Law Community Council, concerns were raised in regards to an update and lack of information pertaining to the fire recovery and also the fire investigation uh, regarding the Glasgow School of Art. Can the Minister provide an update on these uh, areas as a lack of timescale and information is having a very real impact on the area, community and businesses and indeed the future of the area of Sucky Hall Street as well? Minister. The investigation into the origin and cause and circumstances of the fire is a high priority for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and its specialist fire investigations teams. SFRS is working closely with Police Scotland and the Health and Safety Executive. Significant investigation work has already been concluded, but the dangerous condition of the structure significantly restricted site access, including for the SFRS fire investigations. However, they are now on site and aim to conclude the investigation early in the new year. And I would uh, advise Sandra White to follow up any further correspondence with the SFRS and uh, uh, and again to the government if there are uh, barriers for which that uh, are prohibitive in that in that way and Adam Tompkins to be followed by Claire Baker uh, thank you presenting officer the um, Glasgow School of Art um, says that the fire was nothing to do with them um, because the building was was on was in other people's was under other people's control at the time um, it broke out in June yet at the same time the Glasgow School of Art says that rebuilding or taking decisions about rebuilding the Glasgow School of Art is a question exclusively for them. As Joanne Lamont said in her opening questions, and I completely agree with her, the impact on local businesses and the local community in terms of residents also in and around Sockey Hall Street has been massive and continues to be significant. So does the minister agree with me that decisions about the future of the Glasgow School of Art should not be taken by the School of Art alone, but in full consultation with both local residents and businesses? Yes. The, as, as Adam Tomkins stated in his, his question, the decision for, it is a decision for the Glasgow School of Art or, over whether or not the Macintosh should be rebuilt, as the Macintosh building is owned by Glasgow School of Art, which is an independent body. Its future is therefore a matter for Glasgow School of Art's board. 
Uh, the board has made it clear its intention to rebuild the Macintosh as a fully functional art school. The wider point, uh, which I think is an important one, around uh, engagement from the community and uh, potentially I, I, I would imagine that there's uh, a question there around whether there should be a GSA trust uh, to be established to oversee the rebuild of the Macintosh building. Uh, the Mac, again, belongs to the Glasgow School of Art and decisions about the future of the building will rest with them. We expect the Glasgow School of Art to make governance arrangements which allow the board to give proper attention to the, the school's core function of delivering high quality education within that consideration. Uh, the member may also wish to engage with colleagues in education, uh, the education and skills portfolio around any functionality of the institution in terms of uh, delivering high quality education. And Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Given the significance of the cultural legacy of Charles Rennie Macintosh to the city of Glasgow, and in light of both fires having taken place, have the government given any consideration, and I noticed the Minister did mention the idea of a trust, to the future of the building? If Glasgow Art College do go ahead with a rebuild, as they intend to do, how the legacy of Charles Rennie Macintosh and any future building is protected for the city and for the nation, and not just for the Art College? Minister. The questions around the trust as answered to Adam Tonkins uh, belong to Glasgow School of Art. Uh, the, because the MAC belongs to Glasgow School of Art, any decisions about the future of, of that rest with them. I would uh, state that the fact that uh, the governance um, questions more widely are, are of pertinence in terms of how the board takes things forward, I would, of course, give cognizance and recognition to the fact that this is an issue currently before the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee and look forward to seeing the outcome of that inquiry because uh, we all have a, an interest here in making sure that this institution is br brought forward again to uh, the, fulfill, the function, fulfill the function as a higher education institution and to do that as well as it has done over the decades, uh, but also to continue to be one of the, uh, as you said, uh, important aspects of cultural legacy for the whole of Scotland. And question number two, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to boost tourism in rural areas through the promotion of industrial heritage sites. Minister. Action to promote tourism is a function of Visit Scotland undertaken in partnership with a wide range of other public bodies that are directly funded by the Scottish Government. Many of those bodies, including Historic Environment Scotland, the National Museums of Scotland, Museums Gallery Scotland, the National Industrial Museums and Transport Scotland, contribute to the promotion of our fascinating industrial heritage. Brian Whittle. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Scottish Industrial Railway Centre at Danaskin near Patner is home to a number of industrial steam and diesel locomotives, including the country's only working fireless uh, locomotives. I, I was struck by the role places like this had in Scotland's industrial heritage. It is run entirely by dedicated volunteers, and although only open for a limited time, attracts a steady stream of visitors. They have big ambitions, including bringing more of their old locomotives into service. So what is the Scottish Government doing to support organisations like SIRC to grow and allow more tourists to discover this important part of our industrial heritage? Minister. As mentioned in my first answer, Museum and Galleries Scotland are the national development body for museums and galleries in Scotland and are funded by the Scottish Government to support over 400 accredited institutions across the country. Whether that's by strategic investment, advice or other means, MGS aim to unite the sector and allow these institutions to develop and thrive. Uh, to date, in 2018, 32 organisations across 17 local authorities have received grant funding totalling over £1 million. We have also engaged in the Go Industrial Brand, uh, which the, the brand of Industrial Museum Scotland, which represents 12 museums across and galleries, uh, Scotland accredited across Scotland. In terms of the Scottish Industrial Railway Centre, I'm grateful for Brian Whittle for raising this point and pay tribute to the work of uh, the Ayrshire Rail Preservation Group and their engagement within this. The uh, wider support that I mentioned in terms of uh, the, the, industrial, uh, the provision through Museums and Galleries Scotland is the appropriate means for such groups to bid for and engage with potential for support. Emma Harper. 
Thank you. Can the Scottish Government set out how Scotland's most iconic rural tourist sites will benefit from the first round of the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, the RTIF, to help meet the demand of growing visitor numbers, including, for example, the otter pools in Bonnie, Dumfries and Galloway? Yes. As Ms Hislop announced on the 5th of October at Glenfinnan, through our Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, we are funding over £3 million worth of much needed infrastructure improvements ac across 18 separate projects from Shetland to Dumfries and Galloway, including the Otter Pools. Spread throughout six local authorities and both national park authorities, this support will deliver a range of improvements from camper van facilities, toilets, parking and pathway improvements that will benefit both visitors who come to enjoy our stunning scenery and locals alike. Question number three, Alison Harris. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that all major tourist attractions receive sufficient levels of promotion. Minister. The Scottish Government supports Visit Scotland, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise to promote Scotland as a whole in order to maximise the economic benefit of tourism to Scotland. Alison Harris. I thank the Minister for his response. In February this year, it was revealed that while most of the top 20 tourist attractions in Scotland enjoyed an annual increase in their visitor numbers, the Falkirk Wheel was amongst two that saw a decrease. I believe Edinburgh Zoo was the other one. The numbers of visitors to the wheel fell by 3.7%, while other attractions with similar annual numbers received average increases of around 25%. Does the Minister know why this happened and what reassurances can he give me that the Falkirk Wheel will receive its fair share of promotion? Minister. Thank Alison Harris for that question. The member will be aware of the uh, initiatives that are taking place in her constituency around the Kelpies and the Scottish Canals in order to boost them as the remarkable attractions that they already are and to continue in that set continue that success and uh, broaden the attraction. Uh, a new selfie trail encouraging families to get out and discover the genius of the Forth and Canal, uh, Clyde Canal has, uh, has been launched between the Falkirk Weir and the Kelpies. Uh, created by Scottish Canals as part of its Canals Encounters campaign, the Wheels to Kelpies selfie trail runs between two of Scotland's biggest landmarks, the Falkirk Wheel and the Kelpies, along uh, Scotland's oldest canal, the Forth and the Clyde. And I would encourage uh, individuals to support that campaign and the Scottish Government uh, really does absolutely treasure and uh, absolutely recognise the importance of these two aspects of our tourist attractions. Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister may be aware of the Yarlsoff archaeological site at the south end of Shetland at Sumbra. Uh, that site is uh, con currently under some pressure because of uh, tour buses caused by the growth in the cruise line industry. Uh, at that site, therefore, there is a need for both a car park for the coaches and also toilet facilities. Uh, I have been seeking to broker a meeting with Historic Environment Scotland and all the parties. Would he undertake through his good office to make that happen, uh, as there's a desperate need for this, and we have so far not been able to confirm a date with Historic Environment Scotland the only organisation we need who, to make this happen. Miss. Thank Tavis Scott for that question. Of course, as he would understand, it would not be appropriate for the government ministers to engage in oper operational matters. But, uh, however, if he would like to write to me after this with third, further details, we can consider how we can engage to assist him in securing that meeting. Question number four, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my registered interest and in membership of the Musicians' Union to ask the Scottish Government how it supports the promotion of the Scottish music sector internationally. Minister. We fund Creative Scotland to support musicians across all genres of music. Since 2008, we have invested over £21 million in the Festival's Expo Fund, providing a global platform for Scottish musicians and other artists, opening up opportunities for outward touring. In addition, the Platform for Creative Excellence Place Fund, which provides £15 million over the next five years, will help the Edinburgh festivals develop their international work. We invest £350,000 annually to support the national performing companies through the International Touring Fund to tour internationally, and our programme for government commits, commitments include an international creative ambition programme to be launched by May 2019. Martha. 
thank the Minister for that detailed answer. As the Minister may be aware, I am convener of the cross-party group on music, and at every meeting we have had since the group was established, the key concern of members representing a range of stakeholders from across music in Scotland is the threat posed by Brexit. With, with, the withdrawal agreement makes absolutely clear that the overriding priority of the UK government is to end freedom of movement, which would be devastating for our music sector in Scotland. I wonder if the Minister agrees with me that any MP, and for that matter any MSP who backs the withdrawal agreement, is no friend of musicians in Scotland. Yes, T Tom Arthur is absolutely right to point out that there is a distinct danger that the removal of access to freedom of movement would result in additional bureaucracy and border checks on touring artists and we'd be diminishing to the UK as a whole uh, and Scotland's uh, music industry. Indeed, uh, UK Music's recent survey on the economic impact of the music industry suggested that half of all respondents thought that Brexit would have a negative impact on the industry compared to only 2% who thought it would be positive. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The opportunity for Scottish young people to tour internationally is hugely important, one which not only promotes uh, Scottish music but also enriches their lives. However, cuts to music tuition in schools because of this Scottish Government is failing Scottish pupils and are, is leading to lower levels of music uptake. Does the Minister believe that this will help or hinder the promotion of Scottish music sector abroad? Minister. As uh, the member will note in my first answer, the support that the Scottish Government gives to our music industry with regard to the music uh, proportion of music funding for education, I think the member would be better directed to place that question to the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education. Mm -hmm. Question number five, Gail Ross. To ask the Scottish Government what help and support it offers to archaeological projects. Minister. I and the Scottish Government recognise the importance of our historic environment and the wealth of historic structures across the country. Many are at the heart of communities who have often worked hardest to secure their future. Scottish Government funding for archaeology is channelled via Historic Environment Scotland grant schemes. Despite recent financial constraints, we have maintained Historic Environment Scotland external grants at 14.5 million per year. 1.4 million is allocated for archaeology. A great deal of information about these schemes is available from their website and staff offer comprehensive pre-application advice to potential applicants and support and advice through completion. Gail Ross. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Caithness Broch project in my constituency are doing some fantastic work in bringing the county's Broch history to life. And at this point, I'd like to direct members to my register of interests as a patron of the organisation. They plan to build a full-size broch and are undertaking various projects with schools and in the community. Will the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with them to hear about all the work they are currently doing and their plans for the future? Minister. I am aware of the Caithness Broch project and am particularly impressed by the project's efforts to use and to engage with local communities, particularly with children. Uh, the Scottish Government appreciates the work that's been undertaken by the project to promote Caithness's rich archaeological history and their proposals to build a full-scale broch as a visitor attraction. However, uh, with, it would be more engagement with such a project of this nature would be best undertaken as an operational issue with Historic Environment Scotland and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, other government agencies and the local council at this stage in the developing their proposals. And uh, therefore, it would not be appropriate for ministers to be involved. Uh, however, if we can be of assistance in the encouraging and facilitating such engagements, then I would be happy to consider how we can do that. And I wish Gail Ross and the project well in their uh, ongoing endeavours. And question six, Alex Crowell Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports communities in the achievement of fair trade accreditation. Minister. The Scottish Government has provided 1.6 million in core funding to the Scottish Fair Trade Forum since their inception in 2007 to take forward our policy on fair trade. That includes realising uh, in 2013 our ambition to achieve fair trade nation status, which was reconfirmed in 2017 and demonstrating Scotland's ongoing progress in supporting and uh, purchasing fair trade. 
Scotland currently has 97 fair trade communities, including all of Scotland's cities and 27 of the 32 local authority areas. With our support, the forum continues to support active fair trade groups and through the accreditation process is in villages, towns and cities up and down the country. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Minister for that uh, answer. South Queen's Ferry Fair Trade Group worked very hard to achieve fair trade accreditation for the town of South Queensferry. This they got in January this year, and understandably were very keen to demonstrate that by erecting signage at the town's markers, only to discover that Transport Scotland has a fast policy to stop communities from erecting such signage, given that fair trade is a commercial brand. Does the uh, minister agree with me that this is a miserly decision and is in danger of actually disincentivising towns achieving fair trade status? Yes. I thank Alex Cole Hamilton for raising this point and uh, I'm aware of the Queen's Ferry Fair Trade Group and uh, congratulate them on, on their work of achieving Fair Trade Royal Borough status. I'm aware that Alex Cole Hamilton has had previous uh, parliamentary questions and correspondence with the then Transport Minister Hamza Youssef and I would uh, like to offer today whether Alex Cole Hamilton would like to have a meeting with myself and potentially the Fair Trade Forum. Uh, following this meeting to discuss this matter in more detail. Thank you. That concludes our portfolio questions on culture, tourism and external affairs. We turn now to questions on government business and constitutional re relations. Question number one has been withdrawn. Question number two, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the views of business groups regarding its position on Brexit and wider constitutional affairs. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. I shall start again. A, as a, a Professor Tompkins pointed out, even debaters of the year can get their debating skills wrong. The uh, Scottish Government's position on Brexit and the economy <coughs> was and is now framed by the joint statement issued on the 7th of July 2016 by the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, Scottish Financial Enterprise, Scottish Council for Development and Industry, Confederation of British Industry and the Institute of Directors. When the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work last met, those same organisations discussed Brexit uh, in September. Their focus remained on trade, free movement, the support and clarity businesses need to plan, invest and grow. I've also spoken to uh, several of these organisations in recent weeks about the current situation and the deal that the UK Government has agreed with the European Union, which we regard as worse than the current position within the EU. It provides for the UK and Scotland within it to leave the single market, and that will damage Scotland's economy, jobs and living standards. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On that point, I want to press the Minister on something he said last week, which is that the current withdrawal agreement is better than no deal. Can he therefore, here and now, unequivocally confirm that if and when it comes to it, the SNP will confront reality and vote to avoid no deal? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the, uh, the members, the version of reality is ever an unusual one. The reality of this situation is there is no need for, to, to make that choice. The House of Commons can, and I'm sure will, rule out a no deal. Uh, certainly this deal, as offered by the Prime Minister, is a very bad deal indeed, and it needs to be rejected. And it needs to be rejected because of the damage it will do to Scotland, and it will do to the member's region, and the member should recognise that. The region that the member represents will be particularly hard hit by this deal. And there will be severe economic damage to the businesses and the business organisations which he has mentioned in his question. So it would be far better that he faced reality, the reality of Brexit, rather than whistling in the wind. Annabel Ewing. Um, as we are talking uh, about um, the views of business groups, President Officer, does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that it was in fact quite instructive to see that the CBI's head of EU negotiations suggested in an email that there was, and I quote, no need to give credit to the negotiators, I think, because it's not a good deal. Cabinet Secretary. There is no doubt that it is not a good deal. It is also not the only deal. And for the Prime Minister to present this as being the only option is completely and utterly wrong. 
This deal is as it is because of the red lines that the Prime Minister set herself at the start of the negotiations. And she did that to try and keep a fractious Tory party together and try to paper over the 40-year civil war. What has come out of the process is exactly what was expected because what went into the process was the, were these red lines. And we should draw attention to the uniquely difficult situation of Scotland with regard to freedom of movement. Freedom of movement is absolutely essential for the Scottish economy, and in rural areas particularly. Without freedom of movement, there will be a very substantial uh, decline in economic performance and a substantial shortage of labour, which is already becoming apparent. And those are realities. Those are the realities of this question. And we should be saying that loud and clear. And we should say to businesses, of course, we understand. You wish this over. We all want this over. But they started it, and they're making an incredible mess of it. Question number three, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what impact assessment has been undertaken uh, regarding the potential economic cost to Scotland of additional customs arrangements and border regulations resulting from Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Scottish Government analysis published in Scotland's Place in Europe, People, Jobs and Investment earlier this year assessed the implications for Scotland's economy if the UK exit the European Union. This modelling used a range of Brexit shocks, including estimates of the trade costs associated with customs arrangements and border regulations. Results from this analysis indicate that the scenario in which the UK produces a free trade agreement could lead to a loss of up to 6.1% of GDP, £9 billion in 2016 terms in Scotland by 2030. This is equivalent to £1,600 per person in Scotland. Likewise, a hard Brexit could lead to a loss of up to 8.5% of GDP, or £12.7 billion in 2016 terms in Scotland by 2030, equivalent to £2,300 per individual. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, and indeed I agree with much of that analysis. The reality has become clear that the costs of Brexit are from additional customs arrangements and market regulations which do not currently exist, but surely those would also exist if there's a differential deal between different parts of the United Kingdom. And I was wondering if uh, the, the economic assessment that he's just made in terms of Brexit with the rest of Europe uh, and Scotland could also be applied to any deals within the UK if there is a differential deal. Cabinet Secretary. There are considerable issues arising out of differentiation, but those issues particularly reflect the advantages to, those, to, to areas that would have a differentiated outcome, and particularly in Northern Ireland, where uh, the, the, there is a very strong view that there would be considerable advantages for Northern Ireland, for example, in inward investment, where investing in Northern Ireland would give access to the single market. So there are issues to be addressed here. The First Minister indicated yesterday in presenting the uh, paper on Scotland's place in Europe, the assessment of the UK government's proposed future relationship with the EU, that further work needed to be done to quantify uh, the actual advantages, but clearly those advantages would exist. I might note, presiding officer, of course, the figures I've given here are broadly borne out by the figures the UK government has published today, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer's own admission that Brexit, on every scenario, will make people worse off and the country worse off. Nobody would have thought it was the job of the Chancellor of the Exchequer to bring forward policies that made people poorer. Question number four, Alex Rowley. Thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the UK's exit from the EU to ensure that Scotland is promoted as a destination for economic migration. Minister Ben McPherson. Migration is crucial to the development of Scotland as a thriving nation. I recently met with the UK Immigration Minister and again sought her commitment to meaningful engagement given the profound impact migration has on Scotland's economy, public services and demography. We submitted compelling evidence to the Migration Advisory Committee and disappointingly the proposals the Prime Minister's Cabinet have accepted ignore sectors integral to Scotland. The UK Government's discredited hostile environment policies damage our ability to attract the people we need and recommendations in the MAX reports would harm our prosperity. That is why the Scottish Government will continue to argue for a tailored and more flexible migration system that meets our distinct needs. Alex Rowley. Yeah, I thank the Minister for, for that answer. And what progress is the Scottish Government making in making that case that, that, that Scotland has uh, a specific case to see more powers over migration immigration policy devolved to Scotland and does he agree that more work needs to be done by the government to promote the benefits of migration to the wider Scottish public? Minister. 
in terms of achieving more devolution of powers in order to build that more flexible and tailored migration system, myself and the rest of the government are working on a constant basis to work with stakeholders who are raising concerns with us about the MAC's recommendations and about the effect of Brexit as well as the hostile environment policy. We are going through a constructive process of raising awareness with business and other stakeholders about what opportunity there would be in having devolution of powers in order to do things differently here in Scotland. And that's devolution of powers within the current UK system to build flexibility and be able to deliver for our needs. In terms of the point about raising awareness, all of us, absolutely all of us in this chamber have a responsibility to champion the positive benefits of migration, especially in the current environment when there are absolutely awful things being said, like EU nationals skipping the queue, as the Prime Minister said recently. Shocking remarks. Uh, I would point the member to our We Are Scotland campaign from the Scottish Government, which has been very successful at highlighting and championing the positive benefits of migration that we should all celebrate. Question number five, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what involvement it currently has with the UK Government's Migration Advisory Committee in relation to advice on migration policy post-Brexit. Minister. The Scottish Government has made it clear to the UK Government and the Migration Advisory Committee that Scotland's needs in relation to migration policy are distinct and significant. The Scottish Government provided a detailed response to each of the MAC's calls for evidence, but this evidence has been largely ignored. We have highlighted to the UK Government that the MAC's recommendations in their reports are disappointing to employers, local authorities, third sector organisations and universities across Scotland. The Scottish Government has met with and heard evidence from a range of stakeholders to discuss the impact of the MAC's recommendations and hear their concerns. The Scottish Government shares these concerns and we are committed to listening to and promoting the interests of individuals and organisations across Scotland. I have met personally with Professor Manning, the Chair of the MAC, and the UK Immigration Minister to discuss the needs of Scotland and reiterated our concerns in relation to the MAC's recommendations. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that the Minister mentioned Professor Manning, uh, Chair of the Migration Advisory Committee. Is he aware that when Professor Manning earlier this month gave ev evidence to a committee of this Parliament, he admitted that no specific modelling re the situation in Scotland had ever been done. That was in relation to migration. There is now a consultation about the shortage occupation list and Scotland has very specific interests in that regard. May I ask the Minister what strong and firm representations are being made about these very specific Scottish interests? Minister. Thank Linda Fabiani for that question and she is indeed right to say that the MAC report paid little cognizance to Scotland with only one page, page 123, uh, two pages rather, and 124, um, a little bit on 124, being allocated to, to Scotland. The, the, the member is right to raise the point about what engagement we are having with the MAC and indeed also the UK government around the shortage occupation list. The UK Minister for Immigration gave me an undertaking in the summer in August and again uh, this week when I met with her a second time that Scottish interests and Scottish government input would be uh, respected and uh, constructively considered in terms of the shortage occupation list. And the Scottish government, of course, will be responding ro uh, robustly to the MAC's uh, call for evidence in its consultation on the Scottish occupation shortage list. Question number six, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish government whether it plans to meet its commitment in the programme for government to oppose legislative consent to all UK legislation relating to EU withdrawal. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish government remains committed to working with the UK government to ensure a functioning statute book in the event of EU exit. We are working closely together on the secondary legislation programme required in active discussions on primary legislation, for example, on the Agriculture and Fisheries Bill and the Reciprocal Health Care Bill. Our position on EU exit notwithstanding, the Scottish Government is not therefore opposed to legislative consent on UK legislation relating to Brexit. However, the UK Government made clear in relation to the EU withdrawal bill that it intended to proceed regardless of the fact that the Parliament did not consent to the bill. I pressed the UK Government to make clear whether it intends to proceed without such consent on such legislation in the future, until and unless we can be assured that the decisions of this Parliament will be respected, we will not bring forward any legislative consent motions on Brexit-related provisions except in the most exceptional of circumstances. It is, of course, important this Parliament can scrutinise Brexit-related legislation. 
We are lodging legislative consent memoranda in line with the standing orders, setting out our views on the substance of the UK proposals. We will, of course, contribute fully to committee consideration and ensure that this Parliament is able to express its views on Brexit-related provision in UK bills. Gordon Linders. Um, last week, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, I think, gave an assurance to my colleague Adam Tompkins that he would speak to the relevant minister regarding legislative consent for what is literally a vital um, bill, the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill. Can he confirm that that meeting has taken place? Cabinet Secretary. I have spoken to the relevant Cabinet Secretary and I am studying the bill and its implications to see whether uh, it would be uh, possible or necessary for us, us to make an exception. I don't know that yet and I won't know that uh, I think until we're closer to the passage of the bill and I have to say that we were only given uh, virtually no notice, hours notice of, of the bill itself. So this has not been made easier by the practice of the UK. But there is an easier way to take this issue forward. The easy way to take this issue forward is for David Liddington, who is in this building tomorrow, to accept uh, the offer that we have made in terms of changes to the legislative consent process that would do what we've asked to be done to make sure that it could be relied on uh, as an arrangement between two parliaments and respected. And in those circumstances, if he were to do so, and if the member were to bring his good offices, has he any on the members of the UK cabinet, then we could resolve this matter very quickly. Question number seven, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government to what extent the UK Government has consulted with it regarding the draft agreement on the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. Uh, officer, devolved administrations did not see the draft agreement before it was published on the 14th of November, despite a joint ministerial committee taking place the evening before. Throughout the Brexit process, the UK Government has not engaged the Scottish Government in any meaningful way, and there has been little or no opportunity to scrutinise, let alone make any changes to agreements which will have a major impact on Scotland and devolved responsibilities. Presiding officer, I think any reasonable person would consider this to be completely unacceptable. Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for that answer. I, I sat on the Joint Ministerial Committees with the UK Government over much of the last couple of years and I know that the Minister has taken part in ministerial forums with the UK Government. Given what the Minister has just said, is it his own impression that in their current form these committees are allowing Scotland a meaningful input into the UK's decisions on Brexit? Minister. Uh, it's no secret that we've been frustrated by the quality of engagement with the UK Government. Uh, we've been disappointed that the discussions in the Joint Ministerial Committee, which the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations attends, have fallen short of the original aim of the Committee. Similar frustrations exist in regard to the Joint Ministerial Forum, despite the best intentions on the part of this Government and indeed Welsh colleagues. Uh, engagement in both has fallen way short of the Prime Minister's own commitment to full involvement of the devolved administrations. The UK Government has not engaged with the devolved administrations meaningfully to agree the detail of negotiating positions and ensure that Scotland's interests are protected in workable proposals. Presiding officer, it cannot be right that decisions on the future relationship with the EU have been taken without due regard for consultation across the four governments of the UK. We need to see a dramatic change in attitude and practice. Question number eight, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what engagement the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations has undertaken with port authorities regarding the implications of Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, I, along with other ministerial colleagues, have visited a number of ports to understand their interests, as well as concerns about leaving the EU. Additionally, I have met with the British Ports Association, which represents most ports in Scotland, the UK Chamber of Shipping and the UK Major Ports Group. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that uh, my constituency is home to the Greenock Ocean Terminal, one of Scotland's busiest ports. And with over 90 uh, cruise ships booked so far uh, for the Port of Greenock next year, uh, as well as, the, uh, as, as, well as the, the, the port activity that takes place, the normal activity that takes place, can he confirm that the Scottish Government is working to ensure that Brexit doesn't affect the cruise ship market and also to the tourism boost that actually provides to my constituency and also the local economy? Cabinet Secretary. Insofar as we can ensure uh, such a thing, then we would endeavour to do so. But of course, um, the cruise ship market is a growing and a very important market. It is in my own constituency of Argyll and Butte of great importance. The cruise ship market depends not just on ports, of course, depends on sentiment. 
It depends on the view of people who will come and, and wish to visit Scotland. We hope they will continue to wish to visit Scotland. Uh, and it's important that Scotland is seen as a welcoming place. Brexit has not been a welcoming activity. Brexit has been an activity that has said to the rest of the world that, uh, uh, that these, the, the, this, uh, the UK is not a place that's necessarily uh, warm and inviting. I hope we can overcome that. The best way to overcome that would be to remain within the EU. Bill Bowman, question number nine. Thank you. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government for its view on the implications of the draft withdrawal agreement between the UK and EU for constitutional relations between the Scottish and UK governments. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the main lesson for constitutional relations from the whole process of Brexit and now the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration is that the UK Government will ignore the views of the people of Scotland as expressed both in the EU referendum and in this Parliament. The UK Government has consistently rejected any possibility of a closer and different relationship with Scotland with the EU while seeking, rightly and properly, such a relationship for Northern Ireland. The views of the people, Parliament and Government of Scotland have not been reflected or respected in the objectives or approach of the UK Government to the negotiations, calling into question any claim that the UK is a partnership of nations or any claim for respect for Scotland within the Union. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you for that answer. Further to that, the, the Cabinet Secretary has said that there would be a second Scottish referendum if the Prime Minister's deal passes. Pete Wishart said there will be one if no deal happens, and Ian Blankford has said there will be a referendum if single market and customs union membership are ruled out, something the Cabinet Secretary once said is clearly not going to happen. Is there any situation in which the Scottish Government will do the right thing by the Scottish people and businesses and end their referendum obsession? Cabinet Secretary. You know, uh, I, I know, uh, I do, uh, that has uh, animated the Tory benches like nothing else this afternoon. What they might like to reflect on is why are we in this difficulty at the present moment? Why, why are we facing the economic calamity that we're facing? Why are we facing the dislocations that we are facing? The answer is, the answer is the Conservatives, their 40 year long civil war in Europe and their referendum. And indeed, the people who should withdraw their obsession with a referendum are the Conservatives, because it's the referendum that got them into this mess. Now, the reality of the situation is I'm glad that Mr. Bowman is such a close student of everything I say, Pete Wishart says, and Ian Blackford says. Uh, actually, he's misquoted all of us, but I forgive him because we, I know it is difficult to listen to such careful, thoughtful arguments and make sense of all of them. So I'll put it, I'll put it very simply to him. I believe in democracy. I believe in the people of Scotland. There is a, there are the howls, there are the howls, presiding officer, there are the howls of the anti-democrats who have got us into this position, have got us into this position. But the reality is I'm a democrat, I believe that at the end of the day, the people of Scotland will have, and I won't be shouted down in this chamber or anywhere else, presiding officer, and I say, nor will Scotland be shouted down by the Tories in any way. Because when the moment comes, the people of Scotland will have the right to choose between the Brexit being, being foisted upon them, being... The Tories can shout at Scotland all they like. The fact that the engagement with Scotland, the engagement, the engagement that these Tories are having with Scotland today is considerably greater than their Prime Minister will be having when she skulks and hides away from the people of Scotland in Glasgow. So as far as this government is concerned, we will give the people of Scotland the right to choose because they deserve that right. They do not deserve to be dragged out of Europe against their will. Thank you. And on that note, we end portfolio questions. We're going to turn now to the next item of business, which is a debate in the name of Miles Briggs on a new approach needed to tackle Scotland's drug crisis. We'll just take a few seconds for the ministers to change seats.